Welcome to our journey of differentiation and integration, where we continue to explore slopes and expectations. Previously, we had seen the path on the left-hand side where we looked at the nice white sands of forward backward beach. Now we're gonna go down the middle path on the crossroads and look at the valley of implicit differentiation. In this lecture, we will look at implicit differentiation. In machine learning, we often use gradients to train predictors. And for some functions, we can directly obtain its gradient, which we do not by Nabla F. The question we want to answer in this lecture is how we represent a constraint, in particular, an equality constraint, like the following. In many cases, there are domain reasons to include such an equality constraint, such as conservation of mass. Or, for example, you may also wish to prevent your optimization algorithm from looking at problems which are not on the probability simplex. So let's review some very basic calculus. So here's an equation of polynomial of order three, uh, y in terms of x, okay? How do we compute the gradient? If you're watching this online, please pause now and try to get the answer yourself. I hope I didn't make a mistake here. Uh, this should be the answer you get when you compute dy dx. Observe that we can write this equation in a homogeneous form by just moving y on the other side. In general, we want to solve problems as the following. We are given some function f in terms of x and y, which we want to minimize, subject to a constraint such as the form G we've seen before. We can solve this equality constraint big G to provide an explicit form of Y as a function of X. We call this little explicit form little G. And we substitute it back into the objective and given this objective function that's purely in terms of X, we can directly calculate the gradient as follows. Let's look at the equation again. This is, equation is almost exactly the same as the equation you've seen before, except now you've got an extra term xy, where previously you only had x. How do you compute the gradient? If you're watching this online, please pause and calculate the gradient. Turns out that there are two ways of doing this. The first way is to convert the equation in terms of x and y and factorize out y on one side, and then you end up with an equation which has a quotient of x's. We can solve this by taking the, we can take the gradient of this by using the quotient rule. The other option is to directly differentiate, and then when you see the product x and y, use the product rule of differentiation. Turns out that there are conditions where both these approaches are the same. And these conditions are expressed in terms of something called the implicit function theorem. So consider the function g, which is in homogeneous as we've seen before, g of x and y equals zero. We assume that near a particular point x, we can write a closed form expression in terms of x. So explicitly we write y, in terms of little g of x. And by substituting this explicit function of x into g of x near x zero, we can then get this function big g of x, which is purely in terms of x. Now, because we now have a function purely in terms of x, we can calculate the derivative of g with respect to x using the chain rule. Okay, so now we can take the function big G with respect to the first argument, and that's fine because it's in terms of X. And then we can compute the gradient of the function big G in, with respect to the second argument, which is in terms of Y. And because we're doing that, we then also, because of the chain rule, we multiply the gradient of little G prime. And now using that, we can set that gradient to zero and solve it for little g prime, okay? 
we think a little bit carefully, this solution works when the gradient of big G with respect to Y is not zero. Then we can divide out that with respect to the big, the, the gradient of respect to X and we get an explicit expression for G prime, which we can then continue to use as a derivative. So the scalar in special function theorem provides conditions when we can write the function g of x, y in explicitly in terms of y as g of x. And it also con provides conditions when we can compute the function g prime in terms of the ratio of two partial gradients. Okay. Now, let me give you a very hand wavy intuition about what the implicit function theorem is. So you can be given any three variables, x, y, and z, and x, y, and z here in general, whereas in the previous example, we looked at specifically x and y in terms of the real numbers and z was zero. In principle, x, y, and z could be in any topology. Okay, so you're given an equation g of x and y, and this is expressed and evaluated to z. Implicit function theorem provides conditions for the following two equations to be well behaved. The first equation is an explicit expression of y in terms of little g of x. The second one is that the fact that you can actually substitute that equation into the original equation and still get the same answer z. So that's the implicit function theorem in a hand wavy way. Actually, to make it a bit more precise, it turns out to be quite difficult and because implicit function theorem is actually an ansatz, which is a way of looking at problems. So the ansatz is that you explicitly solve one variable in terms of another, and then you chain the gradients together by looking at the chain rule. Okay. And in that sense, the implicit function theorem is a way to solve equations. And depending on the exact topology from where the three variables x, y, and z were in the previous page, the implicit function theorem gives you slightly different conditions when you can do this. And if you're interested in such generalizations, I recommend this textbook, which looks at all different types of implicit function theorems. Other names include inverse function theorem, which is more general, constant rank theorem, which is even more general again, the Banach fixed point theorem, which is even more general again, and of course the Nash Moser theorem. Before we go on to an example, I'd like to point you to some literature. So there's a couple of textbooks up there that takes you all the way from linear algebra to calculus. And the implicit function theorem was already discovered by Cauchy in 1916 in this French paper there. The modern instantiation of the implicit function theorem was actually proven by Dini for real values, finite dimensional real values. And this is explained from a view of variational analysis from the textbook there. And as I said already, there are many different versions depending on exact, the exact topology. <clears throat> In recent years, people have rediscovered the implicit function theorem by realizing that for neural networks, you can have nodes which are imperative, which tells you what to calculate, and also nodes that are declarative, which implicitly defines the gradient. And here's a link to a recent CVPR workshop. So let's work through a simple example. So we consider the problem of structure prediction, where we have n sample, which is x, n, y, n, and in this case, the, sound, the label yn, which is a supervised learning problem, is complex. Okay? And for a given xn, yn, and the parameter w, we compute the energy of the learner. Okay? We can assume that we find the best predictor by optimizing over the possible sets of y. Say, so for example, for multi-class, we would just iterate by brute force over all the set of all possible classes. Sometimes, for example, in structured prediction, we, there is a much more complicated optimization problem that we could solve to find the best possible y. We denote the best possible y here by y star. 
given the, the any predicted label y, we can measure the error by comparing to the true label yn and use a loss little l. So therefore, we can summarize the loss per sample loss as something that takes in an example pair xn, yn, and for a given parameter w, and we assume that for that parameter w, we solve the optimization problem over E and then compute that loss. Okay. Now, what we are interested in when training is actually we want to take the gradient of the loss in big L with respect to the parameter W. What is tricky is that there exists an optimization problem in between the fact where we compute L and W, because W gives us y star, which is the thing that we use to measure the loss. So the problem is somehow indirect. Turns out that more than 10 years ago, people discovered that you can solve this gradient by doing implicit differentiation. The same approach can be used for hyperparameter optimization. Okay, so explicitly I can say the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters w has a closed form, it turns out. Okay, so, and here's the theorem, which we will try and develop over the next few slides and come back to this theorem before. Okay, so recall that y star is the energy minimizer, minimizer with respect to the best label y. And we measure a loss for a parameter w by taking this best energy minimizer label and comparing it to the true label. Okay. In this theorem, we suppress the uh, sample xn and yn because it turns out that we're only really interested in taking the gradient with respect to w. Okay. Turns out that this equation here, the gradient of the loss big L with respect to the parameters w can be written down in the following way. This equation looks pretty big and scary, but it turns out it's only a couple of small steps, which I'll go through now. Okay. Recall that the overall loss is in terms of the loss of the individual prediction, y, and the true label, y, n. And then inside this, there's an optimization problem. Okay, By the chain rule, we can just decompose this into a gradient of dl, dy, and then we chain it to the optimization over y. Okay. Now this second term here written in blue is slightly more complicated and we'll try and unpack this. This is where it becomes interesting. Okay. To simplify notation, we denote the gradient of the energy with respect to y as g. Okay. Now we can compute the gradient of g with respect to w by the chain rule. Okay. Note the reason this is difficult is because y is actually a function of w, so we actually have to use the chain rule. So the partial derivative of g with respect to w can be written out in the following. And note that we again have this term that we're interested in, which is the partial derivative of y with respect to w. Now, we know that at optimality, remember, we are optimizing over the energy to find the best predictor. So we know that at optimality, the gradient with respect to g is zero, okay? So setting that and solving for the term will give us the equation we need, okay? So we solve, we set g equals to zero, rearrange the terms, and we end up with this expression for the partial derivative of y with respect to w. And taking that blue term and substituting back into the original derivative, we get the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters w. Okay, that was quite quick, but if you go back and look at it again, you can see that it's actually quite straightforward. Okay, there's one more step to remember because remember that we defined g as the gradient of the energy. Okay, and so we just resubstitute that back in and we get that the gradient of the loss function L with respect to the parameters is in terms of the Hessians and the inverse Hessian. 
And hence, we get the theorem that we see. And in Justin Donkey's paper in 2012, this theorem is presented, as well as further ways to use this kind of approach, especially if you cannot solve it in closed form. In summary, we want to take the gradient with respect to an equality constraint. And the implicit function theorem gives us a way to do that. It gives us a condition where we can actually invert the derivative. Okay. I'd like you to think of the implicit function theorem as an ansatz to solve equations. Okay. And it's quite useful to take a gradient over the optimum as we have seen in the small example. So in summary, backpropagation is just the implicit function theorem. Thank you.